Hello, environmental science class. New day and new chapter. Today we're starting lecture one in chapter six, entitled Geological Processes, Soils and Minerals. Lecture one is going to focus around really kind of the composition of the earth, the crust, the core. Um, what are these plates doing and what kind of environmental impact do these types of events produce, such as volcanoes and earthquakes, things like that. And the first discussion that the chapter kind of introduces in terms of geological processes and soils is just kind of combining other areas of environmental science together and thinking about hybrid electric vehicles. We do this a lot in environmental science because there's so many interconnected topics that you can't just think of a vehicle and forget about all the things that go into it. So we like to think that hybrid electric vehicles are better for the environment because they have higher gas mileage, but we need to think carefully about where we get the materials to actually produce the things like the batteries and other things inside. So there's a lot of very scarce materials and minerals that go into building these. Noted here are neodymium, lithium, and lanthanum. And to get these, it's not a very environmental process. You're using acids to dissolve the metals and the rocks, and you're gonna get the slurry and extract it. So these type of vehicles do decrease our dependence on fossil fuels, but they also produce a lot of waste as well. And also they're using very limited resources to do so. So just we're, what we try, try to do every time in these chapters is take a topic and connect it back to the overall world around us and how it affects us. So that's what we're going to do in the first part. We're going to talk about the structure of the earth and think about volcanoes and earthquakes, things like that, and how that has to do with our actual planetary structure. And I've taken the key ideas out of the chapter. We're not really going to be talking about the formation of the earth so much but we will describe briefly the critical elements of what the Earth is made out of. We'll go through plate tectonics. We'll go through the rock cycle, how soils are formed, and also how elements and metals are actually extracted. But the first two sections we'll look at today are sections one and two. And let me get my laser pointer out. We're gonna go with green today, that looks fun. Okay, first section, the Earth's crust. So what in the world is the Earth made out of? three main layers, the core, the mantle, and the crust. We're sitting up top of the crust and actually a very thin soil on top of the crust. Mantle is above the core, liquid molten rock, and the core is the innermost zone, mostly nickel and iron. Here's from the book, some pictures showing this. So the solid inner core and outside is liquid. And then we have this solid crust and the crust is made up of a couple different things actually. The crust is up here and we've got this mantle. So the mantle is made up of the solid upper mantle and the asthenosphere. And this is a cool picture showing if we took the earth and put a cross section across the earth, it would be about the length of the United States like this. So we see the very thin crust up here compared to the rest, lithosphere, the asthenosphere, and that's all part of the mantle. Then we have the outer core and then we have the inner core. So we're not really going to dig in too deep into the uh, kind of pieces of the earth, but it's good to be aware of this inner zone. This is gonna come back later. So if we think about what the mantle is made out of, this molten rock, it's very, very warm. And that at high heat is gonna create these convections. So because of those convections in the, in the mantle, we get this movement on top of the crust. So for now, just be aware of these different pieces of the Earth's crust, the inner and outer core, and then the solid inner core here. And that's all you need to know about that section. So that really was the first key idea. Key idea number two, this is where we're going to be spending pretty much the rest of the slides here. So we're going to look at plate tectonics and talk about environmental science, importance of environmental science because of that. So plate tectonics. This shows the key point here that the Earth is not so static as we might think. It's very, it's changing all the time. It's dynamic, constantly changing. So there's three geological cycles we're talking about in this chapter. The first one right now we're going to focus on is the tectonic cycle. Then we'll go to the rock, style, rock, rock cycle and the soil formation. Convection and hot spots. So we talked about the core of the Earth. It's very hot. What we think is happening is Specific elements, radioactive isotopes of those elements are decaying and producing a lot of energy and heat because of that. So there's this constant decay process. There's a lot of elements 
a lot of mass in there. It's very dense. So it's not going to last forever. But within our lifetime, of course it is. So it's creating a lot of heat. And that, hen that heats up this hot magma and that rises up and spins around in these large currents. And on the top of the earth, there's places where this molten material actually will reach the mantle and actually re from the mantle, I'm sorry, to reach the lithosphere. And we call those hot spots. So plate tectonics, how do these hot spots and how does this convection have to do with the top plates? Well, it has to do with this theory that came out in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, that the Earth's lithosphere is divided into these moving plates. And there's a theory that this, the Earth, all the land used to be one kind of big continent. They called Pangea or Pangea, I'm not exactly sure how you say that. And as a Christian, um, this might give you pause, but to be honest, it doesn't really go against my Christian faith as a Christian sci a scientist that is also a Christian because there could be a lot of explanations for this. I believe God created all this. And this really just has to do with the time frame of when this happened and how it happened. And you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us a whole lot about that. In my mind, the flood explains a lot of this type of stuff. But there's a lot of evidence for this type of original big continent. We see different types of rock assemblages on different continents. So it's curious to see these ancient rock assemblages on different continents. And also you find different um, specific fossils of species that are way across here in South America and way across here on South Africa, for example, where they might've been connected. So that's pretty interesting. So what happened? How did these start moving? Well, there's a lot of theories on why that happened. But what we see now is that there's these really large plates that can actually move on top of the denser plates on the bottom. So if we look at the world as it is now, it's divided up into lots of different types of tectonic plates. We have the ones on top and then the ocean plates. So the continental plates are sitting on top of the more dense material, which are the oceanic plates. So the oceanic plates are, all, are moving and the continental plates are also moving. And you see these fault lines, we're gonna talk about those later, but these are the divisions between these big plates. So we have this big oceanic plate and we have this big North American plate on top of it. So that's gonna be very important where these plates kind of interact. We will see this map depicted again later on when we talk about the environmental effects of these plates. Notice these dotted lines are called collision zones. They have some other terminology that I'm not going to really go through right now, but this gives you an idea of how the earth is divided into all its different types of oceanic and continental plates. So how do they move? Well, first of all, there's a density difference. So the less dense material up here is going to float on top of the more dense material down here. And it's this convection though is key. So the convection is what is responsible for our plate movements. It causes these oceanic plates to spread apart and then new rocks are going to rise to the sur surface at these kind of spreading zones. So these are gonna spread outward. So we have kind of stuff coming up because of that. And you can have stuff coming out of this, magma coming out. And when plates come together, you have this subducted zone and the continental crust is gonna be pushed up. So you're gonna get mountains and magma rising over here. So you're gonna get some volcano activity when these start hitting each other. So it's the convection that moves the oceanic plates underneath the continental crust and you get these hot spots that come up. So volcanoes then, what in the world is a volcano? Well, these plates, as plates moves over a hot spot, the rising magma can form a volcano. So if you look right here, as this lower portion comes in contact with this continental zone here, this starts to crumble and magma can start to sneak out of here and forming these rising spots of volcanoes. And this is magma forms volcano and these are going to be venting gas, ash, and molten lava. At certain times when enough pressure can build up, you actually get these massive dangerous explosions. Other consequences of plate movement besides volcanoes are basically remnants of volcanoes. So the Hawaii Islands basically are a whole bunch of these, these plates interacting with each other, oceanic plates and continental plates. And you get these hot spots that leave basically islands of the material that came up under the ground. And that's what we see in all these islands of Hawaii. So each one of these yellow dots is a position of a specific hotspot. And again, they're claiming these are formed 
millions of years ago. As a Christian, I don't believe that time scale, but it does not um, keep me from believing the scientific theory about how these might have formed. I just don't agree with the time frame of this type of stuff that they have in our book. Now we've kind of looked at some of these plate boundaries already, but let's look at some of these more specifically. Apologies for the four pixels quality JPEG here from our book, but we can see it decent enough here. So let's look at these three types of plate boundaries. The first is divergent. So that's maybe you think of like the two ocean oceanic plates pulling together and you've got this hot spot of magma forming right here. Convergent plates would be, you know, when the ocean is tucked underneath another plate, let's say an oceanic plate on top of a continental plate, or maybe two oceanic plates going on top of each other to form more rock pushing upward and perhaps magma as well. And then a transform fault. These are not fun. We're going to look at these more in the future. It's the theory is most of the time where you have a transform fault, that's where you can have uh, earthquakes that happen. But really, these two up here, more of the magma hotspots, islands, volca volcanic type activity. This down here is the more earthquake type, type of activity. A really cool example of a convergent, sorry, right here, convergent plate boundary would be something like the Himalayas right here. So from space, you can kind of see this interesting, I mean, it almost just kind of looks like something shoved up underneath something here, this big kind of crash together. So the theory is, that the uppermost mantle of the asthenosphere went underneath the uppermost mantle of the continental lithosphere. And then the continental crust, that's kind of where we're, you know, we're hanging out. We're hanging out way up here in the soil, the topsoil. And this crust where it crunch, starts crunching together to form this mountain range on the collision zone. Again, this is all very valid theory. It's just the time frame for Christians that doesn't match up with the time frame of how this might have come about for. Uh, non-Christians. And whether or not God created the earth like this, or God created the earth in one big landmass, again, we God doesn't tell us. Uh, he didn't deem it necessary for us to know those details of his creation process. But that's a really cool photo of the Himalayas from space and kind of thinking about how that type of convergent plate boundary might have uh, pushed that up there. So faults, we're gonna talk about faults and earthquakes now. So let's go back to this transform fault. So if these are shifting back, shifting against each other, there's gonna be some shearing of rock here. And if we think about what a fault is, it's, you know, all these are fractures in rock across which there is movement. So if there's movement across rock, we're gonna start fracturing the rocks. And these fault zones are large expanses of rock where movement has occurred. So long swaths of land where this has happened, not just small, but you know, miles and miles and miles long. We have these really long fault zones. So earthquakes are occurring when the rocks of the lithosphere rupture unexpectedly. And the epicenter we call is the exact point of that happening. So let's talk a little bit more about these faults. So let's look at this fault. This is from the book. Here we have the San Andreas Fault, the famous one in California that runs all the way up to the coastline and down here in Los Angeles, down in Mexico. And you see it just north of Los Angeles and basically going right through San Francisco. Again, this is a very long fault line. So this is a fault zone, huge fault zone, large expanses of rock where the earth movement has occurred. So these rocks, it's not just like a smooth piece of rock sliding back and forth, they're really jagged. So these pieces of rock are really jagged. And as this movement happens, they get stuck. Kind of like think of like gears sticking together, but they're not moving very quickly. Now they're just stuck. But there's pressure buildup because these are still moving back and moving against each other, not back and forth, but against each other. So when that pressure overcomes the resistance, the plates quickly give way and you get this slip. The rocks break, you get a massive slip of the two plates, and that is what we call an earthquake. And where that exactly happens is the epicenter, and that energy emanates outward from that. So for the San Andreas Fault, we have the Pacific Plate bumped up against the North American plate. And periodically this can happen. So that's a scary kind of place to build a big city because of the geological structure that's there, where there's a chance that a large earthquake can happen because of one of these transform fault boundaries that's sitting there. So this plate's sliding past each other. So pretty dangerous spot for that to happen. And I so let's go back to 
this. Remember, these are the kind of the boundaries of other plates where these fault lines you might you might imagine there are large fault zones, and that is the case. So I took some photos. Well, one is from our book. This is showing the main fault lines in the world. Notice this purple region is referred to as the Ring of Fire. There are a lot of volcanic islands and volcanic activity along this ring because it's the huge Pacific. Oh, let's see, actually, let's go back to this. We have the huge Pacific plate bumped up against uh, other plates, Antarctic plate, the Nazca plate, the Cocos plate, North American plate, etc. So that's referred to as the ring of fire in the Pacific Ocean. And all, all these yellow ones are hotspots and all these red are volcanoes. Not all active, and there's Hawaii a little bit in the middle there. But notice there's different collision zones that we saw before, but this is where all of these these faults can happen. And notice, I took this from Wikipedia, I was curious where the most earthquakes have been. So this is from 1900 through 2017. We're going to talk a little bit about the Richter scale, but basically the bigger number, the larger the earthquake. And this shows the numbers down here. Notice the pattern that we see, it's broken up, but look, here's the ring of fire. There's this side of the ring of fire, which is over here, and this side of the ring of fire, which is over here. Clearly, those are where the large fault zones are. Now, if you look at some of the other ones, there are this little fault zone here through the Atlantic Ocean, and we see quite a bit of earthquakes happening here. Sometimes these earthquakes are just happening on the ocean where not a lot of inhabitants are. However, they produce huge tsunami waves. So they could happen out here and produce devastating tsunamis in all directions. So you still have to be aware of where the fault lines are and where the epicenters of, or sorry, where the, the hotspots of volcanoes are. Sorry, mostly where the hotspots are and the tectonic plate activity is that might produce earthquakes and might produce tsunamis. But just interesting mapping up the most earthquakes since 1900 with the map of the fault lines on the map from the book. So we're going to be talking about the last piece is some practical environmental and human toll of earthquakes and volcanoes. Essentially going to take a look at two famous and very devastating earthquake slash volcano volcanic activities. Actually, we're really just gonna look at a couple of earthquakes. There are a lot of things we could talk about, but I'm gonna focus on a couple of them. So environmental and human toll of earthquakes and volcanoes. We use the Richter scale to measure the intensity of the ground movement that occurs during earthquakes and it's logarithmic like pH is. So a six to a seven is a lot. It's a tenfold increase. So an earthquake that is a seven is 10 times greater than the earthquake of magnitude six. And an earthquake of eight is a hundred times greater than a magnitude six. So those numbers are very significant, significant in their scale. A six to a seven is a really big jump. So logarithmic, just like the pH scale that we learned about in chapter two. I looked up some information from the book and eventually I looked up some more information from Wikipedia, but the book notes that there are a lot of little work earthquakes. So two or less, 800,000, maybe there's tons of them per year or less that are 2.0 per less, but an earthquake of 10 or eight, I'm sorry, only happens once every 10 years. So when this happens, when you hear the news cycles about 8.0 or above, it's a huge deal. They're, they're pretty rare, but they do happen, you know, in our human time scale fairly often. Now, even though that's scary that every 10 years, the thing that worry about though is these 5 to 5.9. These are moderately strength, and they can still lead to collapse buildings, fires, uh, contaminated water supplies due to the collapse of building, the release of chemicals, toxins into our water system. Dams are a big thing to look at, and clearly a lot of deaths can become of that. So we still need to be aware of the 5 to 5.9 size, moderate size earthquakes. Now, I was very curious, okay, what are what are what have the biggest earthquakes been over the past years? So Wikipedia, again, to the rescue. This list, uh, in this case, there's 15 listed here, the most deadly. This is not saying the most physically destructive or the most costly monetary, but the most human life. and. The biggest one to date it was the 2010 Haiti earthquake. You probably remember this happening. It was a huge environmental catastrophe when it happened. Huge loss of life, a lot of structures, just very weak infrastructure collapsed terribly. That was a magnitude seven, and that over 300,000 is the estimated fatalities 
from the one in Haiti. If we go down here, 2004, I remember this one distinctly back in high school for me, uh, right before I started college, the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. This was a 9.1 and there was a huge tsunami that happened because of it. That really was the problem. Haiti was not so much tsunami damage, but the Indian Ocean earthquake had a lot of tsunamis and those are over 200,000. The most recent that you probably really heard a lot about was probably the one from 2011 in Japan. Although the most recent on this list, list was 2015, a 7.8 in Nepal. So we can talk a little bit about the Haiti one. This is from the book. This is showing some of the crazy damage in the roads that happened from the Haiti earthquake. Again, this killed over almost 200,000 people. Um, I also looked up some photos of you know what just happened there and I, I got some photos of this is basically their White House. This is the presidential palace and the before and the extensive after damage of what happened there. So this did not just affect poor people, although it absolutely devastated the poor community, but the Capitol building was heavily, heavily, heavily damaged. So that was just the before and after that I found for that. So the most recent one on this list that I was very familiar with was this one here. So the one that happened in Japan, it's, it's hard to believe it was eight years ago because it just seemed like it was a few years ago in my head. This was a magnitude nine earthquake, absolutely massive earthquake off the coast of Japan. The fatalities were very large, almost 21,000. And according to Wikipedia, it was the most powerful earthquake ever in Japan and the fourth most in the world since 1900 when they started measuring these things. So it was about a 9.0 to 9.1 magnitude. So fourth most power ever. If we look at this list, the one the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami was probably maybe third most. I'd have to check on that one. So we're talking some of the largest ones in recent history that happened in the 2000s so far. Huge problem was the tsunami that swept through mainland. So this happened, let's see, the epicenter for this was off the coast. I should have grabbed a photo of that. But the epicenter was off the coast of Japan, but created massive tsunamis that flooded and destroyed a lot of homes and businesses and things like that. And also the other huge problem was one of the worst environmental disasters in history was the seven meltdowns at the, Fukush the Fukushima reactant, the power plant complex there. So the waters came in. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it had to do with the water pumps that kept the, the uh, fuel rods, the power plants cool. So if the cooling system goes down, things overheat and you can have meltdowns. So this is a big deal. And I wanted to quickly show this website. I'm going to leave this on here, but if we look through this, all my bookmarks, which are everywhere, some more news. I wanted to look at this a little bit. This was some before and afters of the positive, I guess, but still scary to look at. This is from 2016 and showing some of the rebuilding processes. So some of this are regions after the earthquake. I'll zoom in a little. Actually, I'm going to keep it zoomed out. So this is March 17th, 2011, and this is five years later. So still, you can imagine this was eight years ago, but to the people that live there, this is a day-to-day -day thing. It's interesting to see some of these structures that sort of survived. That little building over there. So all this is gone, cleaned out. But you can see how devastating, like these boats, it's so devastating that these tsunamis can be of the after effects of some of these. So that again is the before Five years later, everything is just completely gone, but at least they're getting ready to build again and get hopefully farmlands back up, back in the back there. Really sad, really destructive though. America, we're lucky that we don't, we don't have this much problem with these kind of natural disasters typically. We have you know our problems in California, but fault line wise, most Americans are pretty safe against things like volcanoes and earthquakes. Here's another insane one. See a few, like this building survived somehow. This maybe just a big shed that got collapsed. But the rest is undiscernible. It's just rubble. So they're still working really hard to 
just work to rebuild there. So really important to understand how to combat against the possible possibilities of earthquakes, especially living on coastal regions, and especially if you're living on a coastal region that's very near a fault zone. These are just the two pictures that I had that I got put in the PowerPoint before I found that before and after slide. So that is really the first section. Let's kind of go back to the beginning. Again, what I wanted to do with these chapters a little bit better is to break them up into sections and show you the key ideas that we're going through of what you really need to know. First one is just the critical elements on Earth, just a few definitions of what these are. And then this is the big one here, plate tectonics, what that means, fault lines, what are the ramifications of fault lines, and then some of these disasters and some of the details on some of these disasters. So that is section one. And we will be back with the next section of chapter six very soon. I'll talk to you guys then.